Welcome everyone to another CO2 Monday with Trevor. I'm your host Trevor Matthews and today I got a special guest, a good friend of mine, James Bailey. James has been in the refrigeration industry since 2002 as an engineer. He's worked on CO2 systems since 2007 and has a lot of knowledge to share with us today. Uh, James also started his own business in 2015 called Rave, uh, Wave Refrigeration uh, in the UK, which was a very successful business. And uh, he actually sold it off last year to his employees. He also wrote a book called Culture Redefined. We're gonna, I'm going to ask him a few questions about the book. But uh, it's all about his business that he built as, and sold it to his employees. And I'm super excited about this conversation with James because me and James go back uh, quite a ways and uh, he has a lot of knowledge about CO2 that he wants to share with us today and welcome James uh, to CO2 Mondays with Trevor. How you doing brother? Hey thanks Trevor, all good thank you um, and just a, just a thank you to everyone who's joining us today. So thanks for the introduction, uh, thanks for the nice push with the uh, book um, available to buy from Amazon. <laughs> if anybody does buy it, hope that you enjoy it. Um, Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? And yourself. Hey, okay, okay. So, so I'll, I'll just kick off about myself in the industry. I'm a apprentice trained mechanical engineer. Um, I left school six, 26 years ago now. Um, did a full mechanical apprenticeship with the Federal Mogul Corporation. I uh, worked in the tool room, um, learned how to repair power presses, centerless grinding equipment, specialist machining equipment. And six years later, I decided to take the plunge into our cool world of refrigeration. Um, and I cut my teeth, so to speak. Um, I spent three years at EPTA, George Barker being part of the EPTA group in Bradford in the UK, where I learned um, and became an applications design engineer. From there, Trevor, everybody, I moved on to and did my rounds around consulting so effectively i spent a good number of years at a company called oaksmere who were part of emerson retail solutions so the emerson corporation um moved on to a couple of smaller consultancies real good businesses and that's what gave me my appetite to set up wave refrigeration which was late 2015 so it was more of a lifestyle choice um a number of times I've been seconded into retail customers whilst working at other organizations. And I thought, well, you know, although earning good money working for good companies, I thought I'd rather do this for myself and made the decision to set up Wave. Um, first 12 months, just really working hard, hustling for work, working with contractors, with other consultants, with OEMs. And the growth started 12 months later when we picked up a contract with uh, Asda, who at the time, obviously part of Walmart. And from there, reputation, recognition grew, started employing people. We picked up a wave refrigeration, picked up a big contract, professional services contract with Aldi to provide project management support, technical support, design support. From there, we grew to work with the co-op, Sainsbury's, Morrison's, and distribute to big, big food. So I actually set up um, two years ago when the world changed for us all. Um, yeah, pretty much a nightmare. I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm no different to anybody else. But challenging times in the UK, we had a furlough scheme where we could effectively temporarily lay off members of staff, which we had to do because at the time we didn't know what we could and what we couldn't do due to restrictions. Um, Every week we had a catch up, those who were remaining, and we didn't have a catch up to talk about work. It was just a check in. And at that point, it, something fundamentally clicked when I realized that the team, how much the business meant to them, even though that they actually weren't working. And at that time, the owners of the business were myself and my wife, Jo, and we decided to explore employee ownership as a mechanism to reward the team at Wave. And Late 2020, we sold 85% of the business. I returned 15%. Um, and the idea was to work until the end of 2022. The change had been really successful. I kind of, by middle of 2021, made myself a little, you know, kind of redundant, bit of a spare part. 
I was keen to explore what I really get a kick from, which is um, developing and training uh, youngsters entering our industry. Great reputation at Wave for doing that. Some of our, some of the trainees and young professionals there picked up awards through the mentoring process that we had in place. And I'd also at the time decided because going employee owned, it's um, it's rooted in real sort of socialist principles. Really, um, I go against the grain of a lot of business owners. I'm not saying there's rights or wrongs. For me, I believe in fairness and sharing equity. You know, and it's a great way to increase motivation to get the best out of everybody. And that was reflective in the price that we sold the business for. We discounted it by almost 50%. Oh. Um, so, yeah, and it, it's turned out to be a good move. So I have a second business, as you, you know, Trevor, uh, which is called White Row Software, which incorporates Micropipe. Micropipe's been around for over 30 years. Um, she was globally very predominant in the UK and effectively it sizes refrigeration services, suction and liquid lines from multi fixtures to the refrigeration plant. So absolutely ideal for supermarkets, takes away a lot of the error, takes away a lot of the time, you, you know, sizing refrigeration lines using charts and you sizing each one individually, then going back to build up a network. The software takes it away from, takes away that problem. Um, that was, um, I inherited it and kept the business going. We, we're going through some really uh, awesome modifications to the software within the next 12 months where it's going to do some real crazy things to bring it into the 21st century, make it more indispensable. And as you know, Trevor, you're working hard with, with me and the uh, small team around White Rose Software. So really looking forward to that. But the software was, as I say, inherited from my good mentor, uh, the late Ian Ramsey, who was uh, synonymous with refrigeration in the UK. An absolutely fabulous engineer. Uh, passed away in his mid-70s. We lived close. We used to go out and eat and a few beers each week. I used to share with him projects that I'd been working on, uh, reports that I'd used to write. He'd used to print them out. He used to mark them up in red pen. I always felt that it was being told off by the school teacher for you know, little mistakes, little errors, little questions, but it was all good because it was all to improve my own knowledge base and my own experience. So for that, I'm forever grateful. So in terms of the book, Trevor, Culture Redefined. Um, so I guess I'm a, um, I studied a uh, master's degree in business management 2011 through to 2014. Hell, that gave me a toolbox of solutions. What it didn't prepare me for was managing, running a business, building a business, managing a business, managing people and everything that goes along with being a business leader. So I thought I'd share these, share the story. And it's a blend of it's written in 12 chapters, um, each representing an hour starting at working toward one o'clock, then through to two, through to 12 o'clock. Um, I did it that way for a couple of reasons. I'm, a, I'm really into horology. Um, Love watches, clocks, everything about time, absolutely fascinated. But the book, it blends uh, management, academia and theory with practical application and how I've applied certain models throughout, not just at Wave, but throughout my professional career. So, you know, we talk about uh, Edgar Schein's model, um, Deming's model. We're going to a whole host of models and, uh, yeah, really pleased with the with how it turned out. Um Ain't going to be a best-selling author, but really pleased. The investors in people who who are there and they measure how good a business is. Uh, very, very well known. They operate globally, but very well known in the UK. Their CEO endorsed the book, so got that logo right on the front. So, you know, so it's it's done its thing. But fast forward 2022, I'm following what I want to be doing now, which is all about providing training, mentoring, supporting companies. I've just been just been appointed by a couple of businesses. I won't say the names here, but to develop training and development plans for not just uh, school leavers, not just young graduates, but people under the age of 30, you know, and the cover a wide spectrum. One of the companies is a manufacturer. So there's engineering grad, graduates and young professionals. That's perfect. That's where my bag is, but there's, 
purchasing specialists, logistics specialists, manufacturing specialists. So it's really awesome. And I'm going to be working with these people to build up their own training and development plans. So the field that they have focus and they, they're not just going to work to do a job that can see that their company wants to invest in them. I'm going to be there as a little bit of a mentor, just in the background, whether it's technical support, managerial help and support, I'm going to be there for them. So, so hey, thanks, Trevor. That's that's me in a bit of a nutshell, I guess. That's, that's awesome. That's a great story. Um, so much experience and now right into the point in your career where you want to give back and really help the industry and help young, young people or new people getting into the industry grow. So let's talk about some co2 when did you first uh, start learning about co2 and and kind of talk about your path uh, with co2 refrigeration awesome trevor yeah so the it started gaining a little bit of momentum co2 in 2005 and at the time i was working at epta group and uh, they had one specific project to land for tesco and they give it to their very best uh, tech technical engineer great guy so I didn't really get involved in that project, but the momentum was building this CO2, you know, that thing that's in the atmosphere, you know, it's what you can use it as a refrigerant kind of thing. We started building up a little bit of knowledge base, but late 2006 before, just as I joined Emerson Retail Solutions, uh, Marks and Spencer, um, one, of, one of the retailers in the UK, they made a, they've got what's called a plan A commitment. And as part of plan A, which is all about reducing emissions throughout the business, obviously one of the big things for them was their biggest refrigerants in the estate with 404A, 407A, high GWP refrigerants. They had to change. I was a young, enthusiastic guy. So I worked with a wider team to develop a trial, um, working out of London in a warehouse. And then we landed three stores by the end of 2007 really successfully, you know, not without pitfalls. Those early days, Trevor, you know, I'm sure you remember the, the problem is, um, although the UK has developed with CO2 really well, just as continental Europe and globally, actually, we're all we're all playing catch up. But in the early days, I mean, we, we use CO2 in one of the first systems as a secondary. So we used it as a volatile cooling fluid. I remember the only pump that we could get was 10 times too big and we had an overfeed line from the pump. So we were, we were circulating all the CO2 and the majority of it was just going back into the vessel, you know, so only a small portion was actually needed. But they were the early days, you know, you had to just take the equipment that was available to you. You know, I think, I think all companies in the industry have done such a tremendous job, compressor manufacturers, but I think one of the real early adopters who really did come on the journey early days, Dan Foss, absolutely incredible, you know, expansion valves, non-return valves, controls, you know, they brought to market equipment at a real rapid rate. And I guess anybody on the call who's thinking, well, refrigerant's refrigerant, uh, to an extent, yeah, do you know, that's right, but CO2, it's high pressure. So, you know, we need to we need to be able to accommodate and yeah, work with that high pressure so we don't cause any uh, component failures, any health and safety concerns, et cetera. So they were the big concerns. And I guess for me, in approaching my mid to late 20s at the time, I was like really concerned about these high working pressure. And I think it, this is really worth mentioning. Um, I was once working at home, my computer, my dad at the time, he was working, he's retired now. He was at Rolls Royce and his role at Rolls Royce, he led a team that, um, and he was the uh, lead engineer on a machining facility that cuts turbine blades using water jets. And I'm talking to him about, dad, this thing's seriously high pressure. It's over hundred bar on the high side. And he's like, that's nothing. He said, you know, I, I'm using I'm using uh, technology here that's over a thousand bar to cut titanium, and it kind of put things in perspective that although it is high pressure, actually in the big grand scheme of things, you know, that industry even if we look at the hydraulic industry, the pressures we work with, yes, you know, we, we we've got to be cautious. We're working in live environments, in trading environments, if we're talking about supermarkets. 
food processing, we've still got staff who are picking, packing. We've got to take health and safety really serious. But for me, it opened my eyes to think, actually, what I thought was high pressure, speaking to my uh, to my father, you know, he, he put things in real perspective and, and it was nice to hear. Yeah, that, and like, like, yeah, you just said it right there. Like, I think it's a lot of a mindset as well, you know, because we're so used to working with these lower pressures. And I think the same thing happened when they went from, you know, the HCFCs that are 22 to 410. Because I remember talking to lots of people saying when they did that shift, like so many people were like, well, we're going from, you know, 67 PSI or whatever it is, two or three bar to, you know, 10 bar or whatever, you know, it's like, Wow, it's just I, I believe it's kind of a mindset. And when you when you said that uh, yeah. you know example of your dad working at, with like fourteen thousand psi, you know a thousand bar, um, it it really makes sense, you know, because hydraulics all the time we don't think about it because we don't hear about the amount of pressure that's going on in those lines. But really, it's a lot of pressure. So that's a good way to put it, James. Yeah, no, it's, well, it was it, and it stuck in my mind from, uh, and I think that could be the biggest takeout for anybody on the call who might be new to CO2. Don't be afraid of it. And, you know, I, just a digression, I've worked with, um, on development of 2L refrigerants. And you know something, there's a lot of risks associated because it's mildly flammable, but everything comes back to one common base, whether it's HFC, HFO, CO2, hydrocarbon, it's just following best engineering practice. Yeah, That's what we've got to do. And, and especially with CO2 from a design perspective or, or really probably more from a service perspective, the biggest thing is don't entrap liquid refrigerant. You know, we know that if we've got a problem on a HFC display case, for example, an engineer may go close his liquid delivery and suction um, shut off valves off and work and there might be an element of refrigerant in there hey we shouldn't be doing that we should be pumping a coil down and you know for that reason get your gauges on you know turn isolate your liquid have a gauge on your outlet your suction so you can see it pumping down and then isolate rather than you know and it's just little things like that and that's not a criticize service engineers hey i have not been a service technician in our industry you know i have before i joined the refrigeration game these guys and girls are working in the summer, 18, 19 hour days. Yeah. You know, mistakes can happen. Mistakes really can and they will happen. Yeah, no, and I've been there. Like I've done, I've done those amount of hours and, you know, I've definitely been uh, and gotten complacent a lot of times about, you know, maybe even seeing another more experienced guy do it and, you know, maybe pick up bad habits. Um, but that's, you know, with the HFCs, you, you got away with a lot more than you do with CO2. But once again, it's, you still need to do it the right way and understand how to work with it safely. Because no different than, like you said earlier, HFC refrigerant is just as dangerous as CO2. It's, it's only got as higher pressure CO2, right? And you want to work with any type of refrigerant safely and yeah. understand your local codes, your national codes, so important. And I think training and development is one of the most important things for it, and especially understanding CO2. Any refrigerant, Trevor, you've hit the nail on the head there. They all have to be treated with a tremendous amount of respect. I know subconsciously we all think, okay, which refrigerant needs to be handled with the most utmost respect? Ammonia. Then you're talking hydrocarbons and CO2, 2L refrigerants, then latterly HFCs, but actually they all need to be treated with respect because if you flood a display case or a cold room and dump a full system charge of HFC into a room, that's that's not good. And that that, that could cause, you know, through that could cause asphyxiation just as CO2 can. So the, they're all they can all have the potential to be killers, but at the same time, you know the work of our industry we do some brilliant work you know when you know i don't think we should undermine ourselves whatsoever yeah not at all and I, i've worked and i've talked with hundreds of technicians that work on co2 and i've trained hundreds and thousands of te technicians on co2 and it, i think it's just uh, at first the uh, unknown you know outside the cumbersome 
depending on who's talking about it as well. There's lots of people out there that uh, make CO2, uh, make people scared of it or fearful of it. Uh, maybe they don't really know CO2 or have not worked on it, but I know many technicians, like a good friend of mine, Kevin Compass, uh, from Advanced Refrigeration Podcast, he installed over two, 120 systems already. You know what I mean? And only in the last few years. And he is like, when he teaches his technicians, he teaches them first thing about the safety. And the first, one of the first things of the safety is not to be scared of CO2, you know, because when you're, you're, you're fearful or, you know, you're scared, you may make mistakes, like closing the wrong ball valve, understanding your system. And that training and development, once again, is so important. And it, but it's no different than working on an HFC system. I do training all the time. On, on lots of different refrigerants and applications. And one of the common things I'm noticing that there's just, it's not the technicians are incompetent, they just have not been taught or shown yet. But when you show them and teach them properly and the steps that they need to take, especially with a newer refrigerant, uh, it makes it easier for them to work on. They have that confidence when they're working on it, going into an uh, application that has CO2. And I've seen and I talked with many technicians that I've trained on CO2 in the past, where afterwards they went and worked on a system. They were like, wow, you know, it's not really any different. It's actually easier to work on a CO2 system <laughs> than working on an HFC system because of all the controls. Uh, you can see everything all on one screen instead of having to put gauges on everywhere. So that that's one of the one of the benefits that I really believe uh, of CO two. Why don't we talk about that? What what are some of the you know some of the advantages of CO two and disadvantages? What I'd like to do is just whip up a, a brief presentation of a sure. Put in. I think you've hit the nail. You, you know, if I was an installation technician in the UK, if you're in a big supermarket, you might be putting four and an eighth inch pipe working for HFC, a six meter room. Um, or 18 foot plus, that's heavy CO2 equivalently. The biggest pipe work you're probably ever going to put in is an inch and five eighths wow. within a retail setting. So I'll share my screen uh, for everybody. Um, hopefully I won't bore everybody, you know, we'll, we'll go through. So just a little bit about CO2 history and fundamentals. Um, yeah, your screen's good there, James. Good, good. So I think the, the, the two big points here, so we've got a pressure enthalpy chart, quite a simplistic one. Two points here. I think the biggest point, actually, global warming potential, one. That's, that, that's fantastic. If you've got an environmental box to tick, you know, if we can't contain leakage to an appropriate level, CO2 is a great solution. It has got a high triple point. Now, you can see here, minus 56.6 degrees Celsius, that's 5.2 bar absolute. For, um, for commissioning, installation and commissioning engineers, as well as designers, it's really important that when you charge a CO2 system, you have to charge it with a vapor. Do not, be, do not be gushing liquid CO2 in because of its triple point, it will turn to dry ice. Um, so that's the reason I'm for this slide and also, it's critical point, 31 degrees Celsius, so 90 Fahrenheit, um, it's low, it's a low critical point. In that stage, it, it struggles to understand, you know, high pressure, high temperature gas. I'll go into that a little bit later. That's why we call, we refer to the condenser in a two, CO2 system as a gas cooler. So effectively, we're reducing temperature, we have a pressure release, um, Sorry, a high pressure reduction valve further downstream just before exit, before entering the liquid receiver. So just a potted history. It, it originally uh, emerged in mid 19th century. So we're talking 1850s with the first CO2 patent by Alexander Twining in England. Late 19th century it was seen as the only safe refrigerant. And its former or first golden age was from 1920 up to 1930. Then we had the advent of synthetic refrigerants. These wonder fluids as they were, or as they are. But I think over the years, you know, it soon became apparent after a number of decades, we didn't focus necessarily on global warming potential. It was ozone depletion potential. 
So the likes of our 12, 22, and the others now have rightly been phased out. Interestingly, in the early days, it was commonly used in shipping and it was considered safe to, safer than ammonia. I completely wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, obviously, we talk now about legislation. Why did CO2 make a comeback? Well, 1980s Montreal Protocol, we're actually now with the Kigali Agreement, which is absolutely the right thing to do. So although we eliminated, successfully eliminated um, refrigerants that contribute to ozone depletion, we've still got CFC, CFCs, HCFCs may well have been phased out, but now we've been left, left with HFCs. And to some extent, HFOs, they're a little bit of an unknown quantity at this moment in time. Fast forward, CO2 resurfaced in the 90s, but it really started to gather pace in the 2000s. Um, Gustav Lorentzen, real pioneer in our industry, recent pioneer in some respects, he discovered how CO2 could be used as a refrigerant, both heating and cooling. And between 1988 and 91, he developed what we now know as the thermodynamic, thermodynamic transcritical cycle. From 2005-2010, uh, the early adoption of transcritical CO2 began in UK supermarkets. 2010 to 2015, CO2 started to be adopted very early days in distribution centres and ice rinks in UK, US and Canada. I will say this, I think although technology relatively its infancy, it's growing every single day, it's reliable and we have proven systems. Presence now in Europe for over 20 years, in fact, in Europe, specifically in the retail supermarket arena, it's the predominant refrigerator of, of new equipment that's going in. Been present in Canada, Trevor, you know, hey, this is why Refrigeration Mentor exists because of how keen enthusiastic you are and what you've learned in the last 10 years. Yeah. I'm not going to run through all of these, Trevor. This might be worth circulating. I know we've recorded it, but it's always good to take a balanced view. Advantages, disadvantages. So we've already touched on zero ozone depletion, GWP of one, it's non-flammable, high-grade heat recovery, absolutely awesome, and we should always look to harness what is available, not artificially increasing and, have, and having higher than expected discharge pressures, we've already got a good grade available. It's excellent efficiency in subcritical operation. In transcritical, the performance does drop off. For the, for the amount of cooling duty required, you're going to be putting a lot more energy in. Um, that being said, high volumetric capacity, no glide, which we often have with uh, blended HFC, HFO refrigerants. And as a consequence, no fractionation. If we lose with some refrigerants, if we have a leak on the low or high side, disproportionately, certain molecules on multi-bonded multi and blended systems are going to lose more percentage of a refrigerant that's contributing to a refrigerant that might have three or four component parts. Low pressure drops, high thermal conductivity, doesn't spoil food when it leaks, readily available, cheap. And a big one next slide, but just disadvantages, let's keep in balance. It's high working pressures. There are increased material costs. An example of that, we we'd be looking, we are we do look at higher uh, higher grade copper pipe work. Uh, common in the UK is K65, which is a copper with an iron content in it, um, allows for those higher working pressures, but it is a little bit more money. Increased health and safety risks, um, low critical temperature, toxic, 10% by volume can cause unconsciousness within a minute and death within five. I don't like to labour on that one, you know, because all refrigerants have uh, nasties in them. Um, poor supercritical efficiency, increased complexity, of solutions and where I'm coming from there there's some great innovations out there parallel compression ejector technology all these things need to be managed and learned learned from a designer from an OEM through to commissioning through to service um, it's it's really good introducing parallel compression or ejector technologies and the controls that go with these technologies but we need to have a full understanding to make sure we get the very best out of the systems in high ambient conditions just to reduce that energy consumption. The last bit we've touched on a little bit 
if you entrap CO2, you'll get large rapid pressure rises if liquid is trapped between two valves, e.g. a display case or a cauldron evaporator. Compressor capacity for CO2 compared to any other refrigerant, high enthalpy change of vaporization it's got a high suction vapor density. What does this mean? More for the compressor to grab onto results in higher volumetric efficiencies, reduced volumetric flow rate, and reduced mass flow. So effectively, what it means is smallest bodied compressors and other equipment sizes and smaller diameter pipe work. I'm an application specialist. So my expertise really, you know, although understanding and appreciating the full system, it's that piping in between the fixtures and the plant. Smaller pipe work, it's a good thing. Yeah. So as I promised, just a little bit about uh, the meaning of transcritical. So CO2, or given its refrigerant number 744, it doesn't condense at high side of the cycle because the critical point is lower than the working pressure. So we can see what's going on with HFCs beneath, um, and we can see with CO2, that doesn't mean we don't condense it. We're actually removing heat, so it's actually the gas cooler that the condenser is doing, is working its process. And in lower ambient condition, it is actually gonna see a state change. But with the advent of high pressure um, dropper valves to reduce the pressure and reliquify that CO2, we're in a good place. We've got the components. We've got the technology now. All we really need is an increase in and sharing in knowledge and experience. Brings me to my final slide again. Thumbs up for CO2 here. Two items, lower viscosity. It has a higher Reynolds number. There's an increase in turbulence within the pipe work. There's also a higher thermal conductivity. So we're getting better heat transfer here. Um, so both of these things increase the overall transfer coefficient in the heat exchangers, including gas coolers, evaporators, and any internal heat exchangers. So Trevor, everyone listening, I'm going to I'm going to kill the slideshow there and go back into discussion. I'm kind of mindful of time and questions, etc. So, so that one there, that last slide, when you said that, um, that means it has a better net refrigeration effect than other refrigerants. Yeah, you get a lot more bang for your buck. It really does use its surface area. So the, these, there's pitfalls, there's pros and cons. Um, we can't be guided and think, oh, wow, it uses, it, it uses the full effective surface area. Ultimately, it is a high-pressure refrigerant, so you're going you, you're gonna to put more energy in to get the same cooling duty out. But whilst it's in the system, we've got smaller pipe work, got smaller components and it's using a better surface area so so yeah. it's, it's, it is actually a good it is a good refrigerant um but the only downside for me is it's the high pressure it's not the danger associated with high pressure it's it's a volatile fluid yeah and uh well here in canada our climate is nice and cool so like it's a perfect refrigerant for for this app like that application like in supermarkets i'm seeing more heat pumps and chillers coming into canada with co2 in it and what you will run in subcritical most of the year here yeah. you know there are some applications and maybe they do the same thing in the uk but they will even in the cold climates they'll they will push it into transcritical for heat recovery or heat reclaim to mm -hmm. you know heat spaces in the building uh, which is really cool. And, and there's even more, I believe there's more and more systems coming out there that are full systems. And what I mean by that, they, it'll do the refrigeration side, it'll do the air conditioning side and heating side with just CO2 and uh, seeing more and more systems evolve like that. So it, it's very interesting times uh, for CO2 refrigeration, that's for sure. Hey, Trevor, I think it, we, we come back to this, um, you know, you've mentioned Canada in the UK as well. We do have warm days and we do have times of year where the systems have got transcritical. But by and large, we are subcritical. We're in a colder climate. It's, you know, the the, the issue is the closer you get to the equator, warmer climates, there's, there's, other, uh, there's other factors that come into play. That's why in the UK, parallel compression, real good, really popular. Now let's talk. What is why is a parallel compressor required? Well, in your liquid receiver, in the high pressure receiver, 
you're always going to have an element of CO2 that's still in a gas phase. And, and without parallel compression, you're feeding it back into the suction header of the rack. That rack might be set to run, I'm talking in SI units here, minus nine. The reality is that's already at higher condition. So it doesn't have to go through the amount of work. So by having a parallel compressor, you can reduce that auxiliary parallel machine. You might only have to set it at minus four rather than feeding it back through the main manifold to feed the bulk of the compressors. So it's actually in some respects quite, quite simple. Um, we haven't really seen much uptake of eject technology. Now I'm no expert in ejectors, but I've, <laughs> From my experience, I think we're looking at a real good technology. We're looking at a game changer in terms of really warm set Southern European ambient conditions. We're actually looking at some technology there, which we're going to not eliminate the transcritical operation, but we're actually going to make it, we're actually going to make these systems as energy, maximizing energy performance to the absolute limit. Mm. To, to mitigate against high energy costs. And you hit the nail on the head. And as I touched on, the high grade heat recovery that's available. Oh my goodness, it can be well over 100 degrees and not just in the middle of summer. Um, and to your point, Trevor, I've worked on a number of projects where we've actually uh, what we call a false load coil, which can take the form of uh, a condenser, but running as an evaporator or, or having evaporators mounted externally, running at a different condition. So we're not putting an onus on the refrigeration system per se. Yes, we are, but we, we're running at a different condition. That's actually there to increase the amount of uh, work that the rack's going to work on and how much high pressure, high temperature discharge gas we've got available. Because if you manage that correctly, you're going to get high grade heat, which can either partially or fully heat a space in those colder months of the year. So although we might look, yeah, energy, it's going to cost energy to do so, but we don't actually need to run a specific uh, simplified air conditioning heat pump or a gas fired uh, air handling system, for example. So it's really good. And you've touched on a, there's a, there's a big market now, CO2 heat pumps. You know, we, we're all decarbonizing around the globe, around the world. We're wanting to reduce our emissions. The refrigerant of CO, of GWP of one. I think, I think uh, in years to come, I think we're going to see that CO2, you know, I think um, away from our industry, CO2 as a refrigerant to the layman, to people who don't work in our industry, will become more familiar with CO two being a wonder fluid for heat pump technology. No, I believe so too. I've I've worked with lots of uh, manufacturers already who are designing heat pump systems in CO two, and I've actually met a few on LinkedIn that have been working with uh, CO two heat pumps for like fifteen years. They've been developing and and working on them, and so they're 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 already here. It's not like it's it's anything new. And Japan has tens of thousands of uh, heat CO two heat pumps, so. Um, it's just us as technicians, as engineers, as refrigeration professionals to really uh, embrace this technology, not be afraid of it, learn it, uh, because it is still relatively new to a lot of, I see some names um, in the chat that I know they've been working on CO2 for many, many years now. And one of the big things is, is that we as a group, as refrigeration professionals, need to continue to share the knowledge about CO2 and how to work with it safely and understand it. Because there's a lot lot to it, right? And, we, and there's different systems. Like you, you talked about, we got the transcritical system or a basic booster system where it's, it's just you got a high pressure valve and a bypass valve. So really what's happening is that for those that don't know, in a booster system, you bypass about 30 to 40% of the capacity that is not being used at all. So it's very inefficient when you're running in transcritical. And this is the early days of CO2 after uh, secondary, using CO2 as a secondary, as you said, you were, you were first introduced to James, uh, pumping CO2 out to the circuits and back. But then, you know, instead of wasting that 30 or 40 percent, you know, you talked about parallel compression where now you can really reuse that bypass gas Mm -hmm. and uh, decrease that compression ratio. And that's the big thing Absolutely. I do in all my yeah. talks. Yeah. 
you want to reduce the compression ratio when you do reduce re uh, the, the compression ratio you know you reduce work you reduce heat you use smaller even smaller compressors than you would have for your transcritical so there's so many cool things about the technology that's happening and you want to understand these terminology you know critical point that james talked about triple point you know transcritical subcritical um, so transcritical is when you're above 87.8 degrees Fahrenheit or 31 Celsius. That's your transcritical state or your supercritical fluid state where there's no pressure temperature relationship. And then when you're below that, it's like a standard HFC. You're in your subcritical zone. So lots of cool terminology that you really want to spend some time and research that on. So, so James, why don't we uh, talk about a few other projects? Have you worked on any uh, transcritical projects and helped uh, design and engineer um, uh, trans CO2 transcritical system? And what are some tips you could give to either engineers that are on here or technicians uh, about the design? Because I really believe when I started learning more about the design and the engineering side of a refrigeration system, as a technician, I became way better at troubleshooting because I could see and think of the bigger picture of that refrigeration system. So what are some of the tips on CO2 transcritical systems you could give both for an engineer as well as a technician? I think I think for me, Trevor, the, the, the real big thing here is that you've... <laughs> We, we've spoken about it's very similar to HFC systems. There's nothing to be to, to be afraid of. The trickery in terms of thermodynamics and to, talking to the mechanical engineer is that certain times of the year, the gas cooler is not going to be condensing. We're not going to be changing state from a gas into a liquid. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's quite a big thing to, to be able to, although it sounds simplistic, it's only simplistic once you've absorbed and you understand because if you work years and years on a HFC system, you know what's coming out of the condenser. It's going to be a high pressure liquid. Yeah. It's not going to be a high pressure gas. It's high pressure liquid. I think it's just that understanding of the high pressure expansion valve at your receiver vessel. And what you'll see for, for me, the I think it's the ICTMS valve and the route from Danfoss and those others available. That's a modulating stepper valve. So it's regulating um, to, to precisely match what's coming down. So we're ending up with liquid CO2. So I think those things there, uh, those two are key components for me. So of what's going on in your discharge line from entering your gas cooler to actually becoming a liquid once you hit the liquid receiver apart from that that's it there's an element of mechanics to understand there but i think as well as as we've evolved and i can be a great one for this trevor i was a big fan when i joined the industry of of mechanical uh, tv thermal expansion valves because you could set your supra but you're talking one one control and you set what what am i going to set my supra up in just one evaporator a system might have 50 evaporators connected to it so i think the big thing for me my advice to any sort of young professional young technician without a lot of experience i think if i was starting from scratch coinciding with understanding the basics of thermodynamics understand what's going on with controls which yeah. is the controls of our industry, which is allowing us to use a lot of or allowing CO2 and other refrigerants to be reintroduced. Yeah. And I, I really I, I tell that to a technician for years now. And uh, for, for many years, I've been uh, telling refrigeration mechanics and technicians that you need to understand controls. And I've been seeing it even when I was still on the tools years and years ago is that I could see the electronics and I, I was in the supermarket industry so I seen a lot of controls already but now we're seeing it at even in small condensing units you'll have electronic controls and it's going to continue to evolve like that so the big thing is is I feel like controls is hard for most people when you're always working on mechanicals it's hard it's to do the hard things is sometimes really hard right so take the time to learn those because that, that controller like the Danfoss 
uh, valve. You talked about that high pressure valve. Some people call it the magic valve. The controller for it has a lot of parameters and you want to understand what each parameter does. And what, I, what I've done and I've seen over the years and I've even a, a culprit of this is by, oh, I don't really know that one. I'll skip that parameter. You know, I don't really understand it. But you need to understand and learn each one. And when and if you don't know it, ask ask somebody why does this do what it does? Because that that controller for that Danfoss high pressure valve, it does a lot of things. So when you're in transcritical, it's gonna make the valve work one way. When it's in subcritical, it's gonna work another way, and it's gonna work on either pressures or temperatures, and it all depends on how you set it up. So this is so important, understanding design, understanding the controller, the components, and how each one of them works is so important. And it's no different when you're working on a standard system today. If you don't know how a component works specifically, you're gonna, it's gonna take you longer to troubleshoot, it's gonna take you longer to solve the problem, or you're gonna make it worse if you don't know and i've seen that many many times where i feel support and, and even doing it myself from experience from from not knowing something and playing around with it and and breaking things so it's so important it's, and like you said and i really believe that's probably the biggest one for refrigeration today is understanding controls don't be afraid of it if you don't know just take the time you don't have to know it overnight i tell everybody all the apprentices i work with the mechanics i work with is you don't need to know everything about CO2 overnight, everything about controllers overnight. But if you start working at it today and learning a little by little each day, you'll have a little more knowledge. By the end of the year, you'll have a lot of CO2 knowledge. You know, Trevi, I think away from, let's talk about the concept, you've hit a big thing on our industry. And it doesn't matter if we're UK, Canada, if we're out in Asia, wherever it may be. I would always be, so if there's any young people on, and it's something we'd all agree, us with a little bit more experience and years within the industry, never be afraid to ask a question if you're unsure, because that promotes dialogue. It gets a conversation going. The most experienced of engineers can very well learn from something which is a relatively simple question. So that's one of the big things in our industry, and that's one of the big things I've always got to kick from, just like you, Trevor, I've trained a lot of young sort of applications engineers and maybe they don't have the experience of me, but the certain subject matters where they're at expert level compared to me now. And, you know, it's really satisfying. You know, when you set them on the way and they might ask what they think is a stupid question, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, I think asking the same question over and over again is a little bit, you know, tiresome, but uh you know, I think especially with CO2 and just refrigeration as a whole, I think the biggest thing for me, it's not high pressure, it's not flammability, it's having the ability to ask questions and learn. Yeah, 100%. And I, I learn more. I do lots of trainings uh, and seminars and workshops, and I know for sure I'm learning more as supposed to be the expert up there than half the time the students are because they're asking such good questions about it and it makes me think and makes me go and research and learn and that as a technician as an engineer out there especially with co2 when someone comes up with a, a terminology or or comes up with a question about it and you don't know don't just let it go away write it down maybe you can't look it up that moment and go research do that research to find out for yourself because when you can start learning things about co2 and then you can say them in your own words that makes sense to you and other people, you're gonna grow and you're gonna to continue to get more knowledge. And because CO2 is here, right? it's not going away. You're gonna see more and more of it in the refrigeration side. And I'm seeing it in the air conditioning side now. Like we talked about already, chillers have CO2, heat pumps have CO2, air conditioners have CO2 in it. So it's gonna to continue to evolve. So if you take the time to learn a little bit now, going forward, you're gonna be prepared when you get that opportunity either to design a, a CO2 system or work on a CO2 system as a technician. Trevor, you and I, we spoke recently about this and there's a lot of good companies in our industry, a lot of good manufacturers. There's also some household brands now. You know, we've spoke Panasonic, Panasonic making CO2 equipment, you know, that they see the potential. And you've mentioned about the multi-system, one that can do medium temperature so we can chill foods a high temperature provide air conditioning, also heat recovery. Bacon have recently released their Conveni pack. It's mm -hmm. reconfigured away from R410 and R5 
407C, which they introduced it on around 2007, 2008, there's now got a CO2 version of it. Mm. You know, as you say, we, we've come into a time where there's a lot of cool stuff going on. We've got big manufacturers, value engineering. That's good for everybody. Mm -hmm. But then we've got others who are pushing the boundaries like Daikin to allow a specific system. It's a one, it's a one stop system, which can do all these things. Now I've not looked at it. It's going to be a little bit complex. You know, there's going to be four way valve systems, going to be valves here, valves there, quite complex controls, but that's not a bad thing. You know, as you say, we're, you know, we're, we're looking at a refrigerant with GWP of one, you know, let's make the best of it when it does run inefficiently because we, we mustn't forget in certain regions, certain times of the year, we can't bury our head in the sand and just hope that it goes away. Yeah. Let's learn, let's work with it, let's make it more efficient. Yeah, exactly. I, I totally agree. I've got a question here, uh, James. Mm. Uh, Dan Foss produce mechanical CO2 expansion valves. Do you want to answer that, James? Does Dan Foss produce mechanical CO2 expansion valves? I'm, I'm unsure they will, they'll, they'll definitely have mechanical valves, which you'll be able to use. Um, but I, I think they, they've really concentrated on their um, electronic expansion valves. Uh, the one that springs to mind, the one that that's common and I've most experienced is their AKV high pressure range. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know... Um... Any, I don't believe there's any mechanical valves for CO2, like for expansion, because it, it does not react fast enough. And I, I'll look into this a bit more, but I know for sure when I was, I did a lot of research, there was no valves, uh, mechanical valves that could uh, react fast enough. So all the ones that I've ever seen are stepper or pulse valves in CO2 systems. So hopefully that answers your questions. There's a lot going on, isn't there, Trevor? I mean, as you say, you know, uh, the need, you're looking for rapid reaction. You know, some of the Corel stepper valves, there's literally hundreds of steps. Yeah, with, thousands. With valves. Yeah. And there's there's a lot of manufacturers, so I highly recommend um, you go to look them up. And, the, and I don't know them all. Like, I know Sporlin has some, Danfoss, Corel, you said, Sigamea, um, Emerson. Uh, and then the list goes on. Uh, for for valve manufacturers so what you really need to do is take the time and do some research on your own and not on the job you know i know as a technician that we all want to get paid for our work but your knowledge is more important and it doesn't matter how much money that somebody's going to pay you that knowledge that you have you keep it with you you know and and when you learn how to work on these systems you're going to be invaluable because there's not enough technicians out there, especially in North America, there's not enough that know CO2. There's a handful of, of people and most of them are field support from the manufacturers because they're going around starting it up with the technicians. And then a lot of companies will rely on one, two or three guys, depending on how big your, your business is. All the rest of the technicians, are, they, they're, when they're doing service calls, they're flying on the seat of their pants a lot of times. And which is, it's not, not, for me, I'm not happy about that because we need to get that knowledge out there. And that's one of my goals to help educate the industry on CO2 because we need more people to understand that it's not hard to work on CO2, but you do need to be safe. Okay. Well, Gregory, thank you very much. I'm going to take a look at this one. So, Gregory threw out uh, a model number of a Dan Foss mechanical valve. So see, I learned something new every day. So this is amazing. I'm gonna check this one out. Thank you very much, Gregory. Okay, I've got a question here uh, for you, James. What is the uh, predominant CO2 rack designers in the UK? Okay, we've got some good ones. Um, so in terms of designers through to, you know, I'm gonna class those as OEM manufacturers. Yep. Um, Arctic Circle, uh, who are in the southwest, absolutely fantastic bunch of uh, engineering professionals, great company. Um, they've been involved with CO2 from the early days. Uh, they're, they're the manufacturer who, who landed the first trial with the uh, Emerson or Copeland transcritical scroll compressor. Wow. Fabulous company. Uh, great set of engineers there. Uh, Hubbard. Awesome business, part of Daikin, uh, part of Daikin Group. They've been quite big into CO2 racks now for five years. Um, 
Space Engineering. Space Engineering have got links with uh, Advancer, another great company. Um, EPTA, I'm not sure if EPTA actually manufactured the plant solutions that they provide in the UK or not, but again, another great manufacturer. And I think latterly, uh, but certainly not last, last but not least, is uh, Clared Engineering. Clared have been manufacturing CO2 reacts for five, about five years now. And they're making some big serious inroads into CO2 heat pumps. So we've got a, we, we've got a good collective, uh, you know, wow. We've got a good set of manufacturers in the UK. You know, we're, we're a small island, effectively, but there's some, there's some good, strong businesses there. Yeah, it sounds like, like I've heard all of the those names before of OEM, so for sure. Like, uh, and it's going to continue to grow. Their brand's going to continue to grow in in CO two um, because any any of the refrigeration players that well, they're all getting into it. All the ones, any ones that I knew that wasn't doing CO two, say three or four years ago, they're already investing money into co2 either into their designs into uh um, builds or, or already starting to manufacture a, a co2 equipment so it's it's going to continue to grow any last words james on co2 hey no i don't think so i just want to give a shout out to everyone who's taken the time to listen um and join uh for me, it's this evening. For probably everybody else, it's this afternoon. Um, thanks, thanks a lot, guys. I'm certainly, you know, thanks for listening to my experiences. Um, Trevor's going to have some r- much better experienced people than me in the coming week. So, you know, it's a real privilege to be invited by Trevor. But, you know, as long as, you know, if, if, if someone's learned even a little bit or just reinforced some opinions um, that they had or reinforced their beliefs and values you know it's been worth the while i've thoroughly enjoyed it awesome james thank you so much thank you everyone for joining today definitely check out james's book culture redefine also check out omega solutions uh his new business uh with white rose software uh and micro pipe uh engineering solution for co2 uh, line sizing as well as other refrigerants so james thank you so much just just on a final note anybody who wants to link in with me on linkedin have any questions feel free just shoot me a connection request over awesome thank you so much thanks everyone thanks everybody bye